Welcome to the Trinity's Podcast, where we explore theories about the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Do you love God enough to think about Him? Episode 157, Listener Questions 2. In this episode of the Trinity's Podcast, I'm going to devote the whole show to answering your questions that have been sent in through Facebook, through email. It's been a while since I did this. It was Podcast 90 that was Listener Questions 1. So let's just jump right into it. The first question comes from Joshua in the UK. He says, I follow your great podcast over on Trinity's, and I've recently become interested in discovering Unitarianism. Just trying to perform my research, and I'm wondering what is the best book resource on Unitarian theology? And also, what are your views on the Christadelphians? Would you fall under that denomination of Unitarianism? Thanks so much. Joshua, no, I'm not a Christadelphian. I don't think I've actually met a Christadelphian in person. I have interacted with them online and have found some of them to be very diligent students of the scriptures, and really have a lot to contribute to arguments between Trinitarian and non-Trinitarian Christians. Because I've never been a part of any such group, I honestly don't know how they operate, how healthy the groups are. I imagine that with respect to practice, different groups are different, and somewhat different in different places. I do disagree with them on their view that demons are not real. I take the view that this is straightforwardly taught by the New Testament. Other than that, I have found them to be helpful in getting a non-Trinitarian perspective on interpreting various passages of Scripture. You ask me what are the best books on Unitarian theology. Well, it depends what you're interested in, and it depends how willing you are to read historical books, so books written before, say, the 20th century. And I'll put links to all these books on the blog post for this episode, so you don't have to write them down. If you're interested in history and are willing to read an older book, and you want to know how mainstream Christianity switched from a non-Trinitarian to a Trinitarian view, I recommend that you check out a book by an old Harvard scholar named Alvin Lamson. It's called The Church of the First Three Centuries, or Notices of the Lives and Opinions of Some of the Early Fathers, with special reference to the doctrine of the Trinity, illustrating its late origin and gradual formation. The short title is The Church of the First Three Centuries. There's a reprint of it from the University of Toronto. It's from an edition published in 1875. This is very useful. There are points at which the scholarship is outdated, because new things have been discovered. But it's a very readable, well-done overview of various early theologians and how they thought about Jesus and God and the Holy Spirit, and explains in some detail how the normal view back then was generally what we would call subordinationist. The one God is the Father. Jesus is not a mere man, but is divine in a lesser sense. That's a good book on that topic. If you want a book that gives you kind of a broad sweep of the Bible and history, then since we mentioned the Christadelphians, one good way in is a book called One God the Father. It's edited by Thomas E. Gaston. At one point it mistakenly calls me a Trinitarian, but I can forgive them for that, because I think I was sort of confused about that at the time I wrote the article that they cite. They've got six chapters on the Bible and seven chapters on Christian history and historical theology and then three more chapters on what they call doctrine and practice. It's got a lot of good references in it. These are all educated people. They're not PhDs working in their specialty, but they are learned, and I agree with the general thrust of this book. Another good book is called One God and One Lord, Reconsidering the Cornerstone of the Christian Faith. It's by Grazer, Lynn, and Shaneheit. This is a nice, thick, but inexpensive hardback, and it really covers all the favorite Trinitarian proof texts and gives a non-Trinitarian reading of them. It's pretty good. It's pretty well done. I don't agree with 100% of the interpretations, but of course that's going to be true of any book. If you're interested in the Bible and attempts to deduce the classical Catholic formulas from the Bible, this would be one of the best single books that you could get. Another one that I like a lot is a 19th century one that I've reprinted. It's also very comprehensive. It has annoyingly small print in the reprint. It's by a guy named John Wilson. It's called Scripture Proofs and Scriptural Illustrations of Unitarianism, 3rd edition, 1846. This goes through, again, all of the favorite texts that people appeal to in arguing about the Trinity, 
It quotes numerous Trinitarian and Unitarian sources on how to interpret them. It's a very useful book. Again, I don't agree with everything in it. Another older but still useful book that I've reprinted, and it's not a hard read, is called 16 American Unitarian Tracts. These are short little like pamphlets that were written in the heyday of American Unitarianism in the early 1800s. It's a whole bunch of short little essays, which again are very useful. One of them's called The Apostle Paul Unitarian. One's called On the Doctrine of Two Natures in Jesus Christ. Another is Explanation of Isaiah 9-6 and John 1-1, etc. Another book you might check out is Jesus is Not a Trinitarian by Sir Anthony Buzzard. That's worthwhile. And if you're interested not so much in the Trinity, but more in Christology or the deity of Christ or different Christian understandings of Jesus, you might want to check out an older book called A Calm Inquiry into the Scripture Doctrine Concerning the Person of Christ. It's by a heavyweight 19th century Bible scholar named Thomas Belsham. So I'm assuming you're more interested in the biblical and theological angle. Those are all worthy books. If you're interested in different attempts to parse what the Trinity amounts to, then just Google Trinity Stanford, and you'll see my Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy entry on this. I also have a piece about to come out in Oxford Handbooks Online in Philosophy. It's called The Logic and Metaphysics of the Trinity, and it does cover some of the attempts to parse the Trinity and talks about sort of where it came from and how it developed over time. Moving on. My friend Tom in Minnesota asks, As I understand part of your case, none of the Nicene or Trinitarian fathers offer the kinds of arguments that tend to be emphasized today. For example, the essential relationality of all things, the irreducibly self-reflective nature of human rationality, the mutually interpersonal nature of love, etc. I think you maintain that none of these arguments appear anywhere before the high Middle Ages. That's the first part of his question. Let me stop there. Yeah, the types of ideas that you're mentioning, you know, when you just put them abstractly like that, I'm not always sure what the argument is. For instance, the essential relationality of all things. Is that to say that nothing could exist without being related to something else? I don't think that's true, because I think it's possible that only God exists. So then he would be a thing, a reality, which is not essentially relational. I'm not sure what the point is about human rationality. When you say the mutually interpersonal nature of love, sure, it's obvious that self-love is different than loving someone else. And arguably, a very important kind of love is love of a peer, or at least somebody who you relate to on an adult level, not as a child or as a pet. Here, I think Tom is referring to what philosophers call a priori, or from reason alone attempts to prove that there cannot possibly be only one divine person. That if there's one divine person, there has to be two and three, but only three. Or sometimes the argument is more modestly put that there can't be only one divine person. You can find a preprint of the essay. It's called, On the Possibility of a Single Perfect Person. This was published as a chapter in a very well-done festschrift dedicated to my former professor, Dr. Stephen T. Davis. Dr. Davis has discussed a couple of times this type of argument for the Trinity. The basic idea is that a divine person has to be perfect. A perfect person has to be actually loving. They have to be perfectly loving. And to be perfectly loving, you have to be loving another and indeed an equal. What I think is wrong with these arguments is very simple. There's an equivocation on the term perfectly loving. As a perfect being, God, of course, has to be perfectly loving. To be perfectly loving is to have a certain character trait. It doesn't require that you are actually loving someone else. God is also perfectly forgiving, but he doesn't have to be in eternity forgiving an equal or forgiving anybody. He's still perfectly forgiving even before he's actually forgiven anyone. Just so, if the Father was the only one who existed, still he would be perfectly loving. The reason people are so interested in these arguments is it's just really tempting to think that we can show that, say, the Islamic idea of God or the Jewish idea of God really collapses because it turns out that they're saying this being is perfect, oh, but he's not, because he's not perfectly loving. If this type of argument were right, then any unipersonal God would be actually incoherent, just that not everybody would perceive the incoherence. 
I don't think it's right, though. I don't think anybody's given a plausible argument like this. And in the essay I just mentioned, I discussed some other attempts to get a hold of this. No, I don't think anybody in ancient times offered arguments like this. These are ex post facto justifications for the Trinity. The Trinity formulas were developed really for entirely different reasons. Some people claim that they've found these sorts of arguments in Augustine. I really can't see it. He just briefly suggests in one passage that the Father would be somehow stingy or greedy if he didn't eternally generate the Son. But I don't really think that that's enough to show that he had this type of argument for the impossibility of a single divine person. Really the first person to develop these arguments is Richard of St. Victor, who was active in the middle of the 1100s, so the 12th century. And really, they were well-developed first by Richard of Oxford, which is to say, Richard Swinburne, retired from the University of Oxford. This occurs in his book called The Christian God, which is a famous development of social Trinitarian, or what I call a three-self Trinity theory. Tom continues by asking, Given that, I'd love to hear why you think Trinitarianism did emerge, why it was ever imagined and pursued at all. What factors do you think account for its rise? A pagan desire to multiply deities without wanting to be explicitly polytheist? Just sloppy philosophical thinking? In the end, what do you think drove them to formulate their faith and spirituality in Trinitarian terms? When we return, I take a crack at answering these important questions. Okay, no one said these were all going to be easy questions. I think, Tom, that Trinitarianism, that is, belief in a tripersonal God, emerged not too long before the first really Trinitarian creed, which is 381. I found a few sources in the 370s that seem to assume that the Trinity is the one God rather than the Father, which you see in basically all earlier Christian theologies. How did it emerge? Well, back in the 100s, they somehow became convinced that it's just ridiculous that Jesus could be a, quote, mere man. And they said, clearly there's a divine nature at work there. I think that's right, given that by nature they meant being. The divine being at work there, of course, is God. God gave Jesus his spirit without measure. It was God who gave him his doctrine. It was God who gave him the power to do miracles and authorized him to forgive sins. It was God who sent him on the whole mission. So there wasn't just a man at work there. As he said, the Father is in me and I am in the Father. They were working together. They were cooperating. So they were right to reject the mere man view if that just means that Jesus is some kind of guru or, you know, spiritually enlightened fellow or that he's the peer of people like Gandhi or the Buddha or Muhammad or whoever you think the spiritual people are. No, he's more than that. He's God's own Messiah. He's now the risen Lord, raised to God's right hand and in charge of his body, the church, destined to come back and rule. He's now in a position worthy of worship to the glory of God the Father, as Paul says in Philippians 2. Some of the mainstream Christians thought that the divine nature at work in Jesus was God, that is to say, the Father. But others thought that, no, there must be another being there who is the pre-existing Son. Why did they believe in a Son of God who existed long before the earthly life of the man Jesus? I mean, isn't Jesus the Son of God? Who's this pre-human Son of God? Well, you could read a few statements in the New Testament that way, a few places in Paul, and then, of course, the famous John 1. These second century Catholics, the ones that have come down to us, a lot of them seem to have been strongly influenced by Philo of Alexandria, whether directly or indirectly. Philo followed Plato in thinking that God could not create directly, but he had to have some kind of intermediary. So God has to have a being which is sort of between himself and creation, neither uncreated nor created. 
This idea that God can't possibly create the material universe directly, but has to do it through an intermediary, is right there on the surface of Justin Martyr, writing around 150 or so, in his book called Dialogue with Trifo the Jew. A while back, I devoted three episodes of the Trinity's podcast to this sort of issue, particularly focusing on the idea of Jesus as a pre-existent spirit. This is in podcasts 74, 75, and 76. So they had a kind of Jesus who pre-existed, was divine in a lesser sense than the Father, not equal to the Father in being eternal or equal in power, knowledge, or goodness. At the same time, they started talking about a divine triad. The triad was God, His Son, and His Spirit. They seem to have picked up this idea from the Platonists that were around at the time, because there are many examples of Platonists in the first and second centuries talking about transcendent triads. So there's the ultimate being, whatever that is, and then this has emanated out a couple of others, which are slightly less ultimate, and then the material world somehow comes from all that. So some of the mainstream Christians, call them proto-Catholics, started saying, well, we have a triad as well. We have a trios in Greek, a trinitas in Latin, and it's the ultimate source, and then two others which come from that ultimate source. And these together somehow are the source of creation. Origin of Alexandria, he decides that they all have to be co-eternal with God the Father. So now you have God, but you also have co-eternal with God, two lesser divine beings. A kind of trinity with a small t, or a divine triad, but of course the one true God is one member of that group. It's not the whole group. So it's not trinitarian, properly speaking. When you get into the fourth century, they're still all Unitarians. Look at the very beginning of the Nicene Creed. It says, we believe in one God, the Father Almighty, creator of the heavens and the earth. Of course, then it complicates things by saying that the Father and Son are one Usia, and that this makes them true God from true God, which of course sounds like more than one God. At least it's more than one being who's being called God. This is good enough to kick the Arians out who thought that Jesus was not eternal and sort of emphasized the difference between him and the Father. It was enough to kick out the Arians. After a delay of several years, it led to decades of controversy what happened toward the end of the Nicene controversy was the claim that the Father and Son are one Usia, which the pro-Nicene people had rallied around, thanks to the untiring polemics of Athanasius, that claim that the Father and Son were homoousion started to be understood as implying that they're the same God. I don't think it was understood early in the controversy to imply that. And then the arguments they used to quote, prove that Jesus is divine just as the Father is divine, so they must be same usia. Those arguments were basically recycled somewhat hastily to prove that the Holy Spirit, too, was one usia with the Father. As soon as you say that they're one God, or that they're somehow within the one God, or modes of being of the one God, boom, you've got the Trinity. So I think the 381 Creed is implicitly Trinitarian, although it really is implicit there. You have to read it carefully and realize what they're presupposing about Samusia at that time. When you really clearly see the Trinity is in Augustine. So he's converted mid-380s, and he seems to think that the mainstream Christian church has just always said that the Trinity is God. And he frequently talks about the one God as the Trinity. Well, that's definitely Trinitarian. I don't claim to entirely understand the views of the Cappadocian Fathers. These were the intellectual leaders in the pro-Nicene party, leading up to when the winner was picked by the Emperor Theodosius. Their views are very difficult, and they're very polemical, and they're, generally speaking, pretty sloppy at philosophical argument. Do I think it was a pagan desire to multiply deities without wanting to be explicitly polytheist? No, I don't think that. One thing that's really puzzling about this material that you see in the 370s is they start to argue that the Trinity is a happy medium in between pagan polytheism and Jewish monotheism. And of course, at this time, we know that the Jews must have it wrong because they're Jews. So the wicked Jews foolishly insist on one God. When the pagans have got these many gods, these pantheons, they got gods coming out their ears. And the happy medium is supposed to be three persons and one God. 
And for the life of me, I don't know why they think there's a happy medium in between exactly one God and more than one God. I don't see any medium. So logically speaking, these arguments are baffling. And you didn't see anything like them before in Christian tradition. I think those may have had something to do with the switch from thinking that the one God is the Father, although there are these lesser divine beings associated with him, and then thinking that the one God is the Trinity. It's not just sloppy philosophical thinking. There's quite a lot of bad scripture interpretation in there, too. If you read the Church Fathers, this is pretty obvious. There's also quite a lot of party spirit and quite a lot of speculating. And there's quite a lot of just heaping contempt upon people who have a slightly different theory. You ask, what do you think drove them to formulate their faith and spirituality in Trinitarian terms? It depends who the they is. I mean, the Cappadocians kind of speculated their way there. I'm not sure they knew exactly where they were going while they were doing this. They thought that they were just defending tradition in the Bible, of course. What drove a lot of people to formulate their faith and spirituality in Trinitarian terms was the might of the Roman Empire. In the year 380, Theodosius decided that the Nicenes were right, that the non-Nicenes were going to hell, and that it should be imperial policy to make Nicene Christianity the official kind and to persecute any other kind. And so that's what happened. After a council rubber-stamped his decision, a council which Theodosius had convened in his own capital city the following year, it didn't work all at once, it took decades to work, but especially after the 381 Creed was reaffirmed in 451, this became pretty set in stone. It's an interesting question why this Trinitarian consensus has lasted as long as it has, but I'm going to pass that by for now. Thanks a lot for the questions, Tom. member of the Facebook group named Andrew asks the following four questions. Is Jesus a God, small g? Is the angel Gabriel a God? Was Moses a God? And could one of the judges of Psalm 82 rightly be called a God? My answer to this is going to have to be a little bit lawyerly. First of all, we need to keep separate two questions. Can these beings be called, quote, God, small g-o-d, or addressed as God, capital G-O-D, can they be referred to in those ways? Is that okay? And another question is, are they a God, if a God is a category of being? If God is a category of being, we have to ask, are we talking about the sort of thing that Yahweh is? Yahweh in the Bible is unique. He's divine in a way that no one else is. In that sense, he says he's the only God. Now, of course, others are referred to in scriptures as gods, And I have argued in a forthcoming piece called On Counting Gods that there is a specific monotheistic conception of a god, basically a necessarily unique, ultimate, personal being, which has to be separated from a generic concept of a deity. Deity is basically a self which is greater than any ordinary human self and which has supernatural power. Notice that in the Old Testament they refer to angels sometimes, or the members of God's heavenly court as Elohim, as gods. I think that they are using this generic concept of a deity. Yahweh is also a deity, because he meets that description I gave, but of course he's also a god in the monotheistic sense. So by definition a god is a deity, but by definition not every deity has to be a god. So you ask, is Jesus a god? Jesus has been raised to immortality, put in a position of ruling where he deserves our religious worship, and presumably he has the degree of power and knowledge he needs to rule the church and the world. So that makes him satisfy this generic concept of a deity, so he can be described as a god. Of course, he is described or addressed as god a small handful of times in the New Testament. It's a matter of dispute quite how many. So, can Jesus be called a god? Yes. Can he be addressed as God? Yes. Although this could confuse people into thinking that he's Yahweh. Is he a god? 
Is he a divine being? Yes, just because of his amazing powers and immortality. Is he the kind of unique being that monotheists are talking about? No. He's been given this power and authority by God. Is the angel Gabriel a god? Just by being an angel, Gabriel counts as a deity. He could be called an Elohim in Old Testament terminology. So, in that sense, sure, I probably wouldn't call him a god because people would think that I'm saying that Gabriel's God or that I believe in an extra God other than the one true God. Was Moses a God? No, I don't think literally. God says to Moses, I'll make you a God to Pharaoh. But I think that means that he'll be viewed by Pharaoh as amazing and powerful and awe-inspiring. And I think that's what happened. Will Moses be a God someday? In a sense, yes, Second Peter says, as one of the redeemed, he will be a partaker of the divine nature. He too will be immortal and greater in power and knowledge than an ordinary human would be and greater in goodness. This is why theologians talk about salvation as deification or divinization, but not in the sense that makes you appear of the one true God. If you want to hear more about those themes, check out podcasts number 59 and 60, my interviews with Dr. Carl Mosier, a really excellent biblical scholar and theologian on deification in the Bible. You ask, could one of the judges of Psalm 82 rightly be called a God? Yes. And I think in Jesus' time, the people described in Psalm 82 were understood to be judges, human people of certain distinction and rank. But I think originally, as is well argued by Dr. Michael Heiser, those beings were understood to be rebellious deities. That's why it makes sense for God to damn them in verse 7 by saying, you will die like mere mortals. That's because they're not mere mortals. They're not normally subject to death. But God is punishing them in that way. This wouldn't make sense if they were already human beings. If you're interested in pursuing any of those follow-ups, I've got the links for you on the blog post for this podcast episode. Listener named Jordan asks, I've heard philosophers like William Lane Craig argue that God must be timeless, otherwise he would have had to have existed through an infinite number of moments to get to the present, which is incoherent or impossible. Since I don't think you hold to divine timelessness, how would you deal with this argument? Well, uh, you haven't got Craig right there. Craig has an interesting and I think plausible position about God and time. It's that if God had never created, there would not be time, and yet God would still exist. So, God exists whether or not there is time, and if there hadn't been time because there was no creation, God would still exist. However, since God has created, Dr. Craig thinks that God is in time, and I agree about that. What you're referring to about going through an infinite number of moments is part of his famous Kalam cosmological argument. He wants to argue that the past is finite, and so time and the universe began to exist, but then there has to be a cause for those. And what could this cause be other than a personal being, other than a mighty self? It's a very interesting argument. I think it can be objected to depending on what your view is about time. People who don't believe in time flow, I'm not sure. People who hold to what's called eternalism about the past, present, and future, I'm not sure that the argument can move them. But it has a lot of plausibility, and it goes back to the great early medieval Christian philosopher named John Philoponus. Another listener also asks about the views of Dr. William Lane Craig. Raymond asks, I recently listened to the final podcast on the doctrine of the Trinity by William Lane Craig. Quote, The man... As you already know, Dr. Craig's model of the Trinity is the Trinity itself is God. What I found interesting about Dr. Craig's understanding is that it leaves out the idea of derivation. This non-derivative model does not feature nor preclude the idea of Jesus and the Holy Spirit deriving their natures from the Father. There are just three equally divine, non-derived beings happily existing alongside each other from all eternity. This does appear to help resolve the problem of the inherent subordinationism that is implied in the creedal language. However, it also seems on this understanding that the referring titles of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are some interchangeable anthropomorphic placeholders, these titles having nothing to do with their respective ontologies for these virtually indistinguishable entities. I wanted to ask what are your thoughts about this proposed non-derivative model concerning the persons of the Trinity? Thanks for the question, Raymond. 
Yes, I think there are two good things about this aspect of Dr. Craig's Trinity theory. One good thing is that he's quite right in thinking that the Bible in no way supports the doctrines of eternal generation and eternal procession. The Bible simply never teaches, hints, or implies that God eternally gives existence to the Son and that the Father and Son together give existence to the Holy Spirit, this all being a kind of timeless pair of processes. These theories were originated by Origen, really, at least understood as timeless, and then various proof texts were pressed into service. And this is a fairly common view among Protestant Bible scholars nowadays. Although there's heated disagreement, some Protestant Trinitarian friends of mine insist that this is just part of the tradition, just like the Trinity is, and it's arrogant to deny this. And furthermore, the Trinity just won't work without this somehow. They want to say in some sense that the unity of the Trinity depends on the derivation of the Son from the Father and the derivation of the Spirit either from the Father or from the Father and Son together. So Protestants are conflicted about how much of this ancient generation and procession speculation they want to buy into. I'm on Dr. Craig's side. I think the Bible just offers zero support. I also think he's right that part of being fully divine, divine in the way the one God is divine, divine the way that an absolutely perfect being is divine, is existing not because of anything else. So it's a kind of independent existence being the source of all other things, but not having a source oneself. If that's right, if that's part of what's involved in full divinity, that kind of independence, then if we accept generation and procession, the Father is divine in the highest sense. The Father is going to be more divine than the Son or the Spirit. People will immediately shriek Arianism at this because it has different kinds or different levels of divinity well, it's not Aryan, properly speaking. People need to stop throwing those labels around so carelessly. But if you're trying to have a Trinity theory where the three of them are really equally divine, it looks like this goes against that. Dr. Craig avoids this by doing away with the generation and procession claims. In his model, the persons of the Trinity are related to the divine nature or to God in about the same way as one another. I don't think he has to say that they're virtually indistinguishable. There will be features that distinguish them. Only the Father sent the Son. Only the Son became human. Only the Holy Spirit, you know, was sent by the risen Son to empower believers. They can have different roles to play as they cooperate together. So I don't think that you have to go along with the traditional speculation that the three of them can't be distinguishable unless it is by their relations of origin. Dr. Craig and I also agree that the Bible and even reason offers no support for the idea that God is utterly simple, that there are no distinctions within God whatsoever. This is a piece of Platonic philosophy that snuck its way into Christian theology. They thought that a thing that had parts or even just distinct properties and components was going to thereby depend on those things, and so couldn't be an ultimate or fully independent being. I'll say one more nice thing about Craig's view of the Trinity. I really appreciate that he sticks his neck out there and tries to interpret the claims of Trinitarian tradition in an understandable way. He doesn't just offer easy appeals to mystery. He doesn't say there are only bad analogies and I'm going to leave it at that and this is a good thing that nobody knows what we're talking about here. He says, well, why can't it mean this? And then he steps up and he says something, even though it's hard to get your head around and it's a bit underdeveloped, it's a bit difficult to understand, it is in the end understandable and it's something you can agree or disagree with. So he doesn't just do the fashionable thing. He doesn't just declare it a wonderful mystery, then kick up a big cloud of dust and make his escape. He steps up and says, well, why can't it mean this? Now, I've taken a crack at critiquing his Trinity theory a couple of times before, and I don't think I've got it right. I think I've got it right now. It's in a chapter in a book that I'm working on. God willing, the book will be called Trinities. I've got a chapter devoted to his theory that he calls Trinity monotheism. I do think it's a theory that's unique to him. I don't think it is the thing that Trinitarians have been saying, really any of them. I think it's a theory that was born with Dr. Craig. And I do think it has some problems. In my chapter, I have an argument that the theory is, in the end, not consistent with itself. 
In the end, I think it's not really properly monotheistic. I think it doesn't fit well with what the Bible says about the one true God. But to hear the full case, you'll probably have to wait for the book. I think Dr. Craig is right in focusing on other things, indeed more foundational things like the existence of God or arguments for atheism, or even his recent project on God and abstract objects. He realizes that his Trinity theory is his own Trinity theory and can't in good conscience be proclaimed as what the mainstream tradition has always been getting at. Still, it's an interesting theory worthy of discussion, and I'm not one of the people who is just going to stand back and mock his use of the Cerberus analogy. That's the three-headed dog from ancient mythology. You have to pay close attention to see why he's comparing the Trinity to a three-headed dog. He's not saying that that's a model of the Trinity, or even that's really a good analogy. But again, to get into the whole thing is difficult, and uh, I hope I can do that fairly in greater depth in print. I would just say for the time that buyer beware, this is a philosopher philosophizing, and philosophers do speculate. And I hate to say it, but Christian philosophers are not always the most careful interpreters of the Bible. Craig is better than many, I'm sure, but I don't think he's got the Bible right on a lot of points that relate to the Trinity and the deity of Christ. So just think critically as you use his materials on these subjects. My friend Pierre in Michigan writes, I am perplexed as to how Andrews Norton, who graduated from Harvard University in 1804 and remained a lecturer there, was not excommunicated for his views. How is he able to remain Unitarian without getting expelled? That's a great question, Pierre. And from our perspective and standpoint in history, it doesn't make any sense. How can you have this famous Unitarian professor in theology at Harvard? The Andrews Norton he's talking about was a heavyweight scholar and famous Christian apologist who defended belief in miracles and uh, wrote books about the New Testament. But one of his books is called A Statement of Reasons for Not Believing the Doctrines of Trinitarians Concerning the Nature of God and the Person of Christ, 3rd edition, 1859, 1st edition, 1856. It's a very worthy read. There are many parts of this that hold up very well. He talks about interpreting the Bible. He talks about the influence of the Hellenized Jewish Bible commenter Philo of Alexandria. There are a lot of interesting things in the book. But okay, how was it that he managed to not get kicked out of Harvard? The interesting thing is that Congregationalists in early America allowed a lot of freedom when it came to views about the Trinity. So these were Protestants who believed that congregations should be self-governed, so they didn't have bishops. And they were from the wing of the Reformation that wasn't creedal. They tried to base their views on the Bible, much as mainstream evangelicals do today, at least those who are not from the more creedal traditions like the Reformed churches and the Anglican and Episcopalian churches. These Congregationalists wanted to go with the Bible only and say that a Christian had the right to interpret it as best as he or she could, with, of course, advice and help from those more knowledgeable they also had a prejudice against the old European model of state-run churches and even imposing a lot of creeds and doctrinal requirements on people as it had been done for a long time in England. So you couldn't hold certain government jobs unless you subscribed to the 39 articles, right, even in the 1700s. Also, a lot of them knew about certain earlier non-Trinitarians like Samuel Clark. And some of them were aware about controversies among Protestants, particularly about the Trinity, going back into the 1600s. So some Congregationalists didn't know what they thought about it. Some of them were Trinitarians, and some of them were Unitarians. And among the Unitarians, some of them believed in the pre-existence, the pre-human career of Jesus, and some didn't. 
Somehow, by the time of Andrews Norton, the Unitarians were an established force at Harvard. This part of the history I don't know about. I haven't read enough about this. But at the time, he was an establishment figure. And so, as far as I know, he wasn't in fear for his job. I believe there were some power struggles between the Trinitarians and Unitarians that I don't know much about. But I also know that some of the presidents of Harvard were Unitarians, at least in the first half of the 1800s. In some, Protestants, at least among the Congregationalists, weren't as Catholic back then. They weren't as willing, a lot of them, to use a heavy hand in enforcing traditional interpretations and traditional theological views about God and Christ. However, certain controversies ensued, and this began, as far as I know, in the 1820s. Then there was a split. There was a falling out between the Unitarian and Trinitarian contingents among them. And then, eventually, the Unitarians veered off and ceased to be a Christian movement. But that's another story for another day. This week's thinking music is Doll Heads by Ivan Chu. As always, there's a link on the blog post for this podcast episode where you can listen to and download the entire track. Next week, more listener questions, some of them focusing in particular on the famous early modern Unitarian Anglican Samuel Clark. If you love the Trinity's podcast, please share the podcast on social media. Help us to get the word out. Twitter, Facebook, Pinterest, and so on. Another thing you can do is give us an honest rating and review in the iTunes store for your country. For some directions on how to do this, just go to trinities.org slash blog slash review. You can support the podcast by giving us a one-time or a monthly donation through PayPal. Just look for the orange buttons on the right side of any blog post. Every little bit helps. And if you shop at Amazon.com, enter that website through a blog post. If you do this and then make a purchase, then without increasing your price, we get a small percentage. Lastly, make your voice heard. Give us a comment on the blog post for this episode. Or join our very active Facebook group at facebook.com slash groups slash trinities. We're always open to show ideas, guest suggestions, objections, and so on. Sometimes I even respond to feedback in an episode. Don't forget then to share, to rate, to chip in when you can, and to talk back. listening. We'll see you online at trinities.org. Till next time, don't forget to love God with all your mind.